Hey everyone, and welcome to the Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. And today, we're looking at the surplus. Imagine that your parents give you money for a lemonade stand. I know what a surplus is. Oh. This one was written by the Office writing duo Lee Eisenberg and Gene Stepinski, and directed by Paul Feig, who had taken over some of the show running responsibilities from Greg Daniels during this season. Okay, so this episode aired originally on December 4th, 2008, was viewed by 8.3 million people, and currently has an 8.8 .8 out of 10 on IMDb, tied with the weight loss episode as the highest rated episode of the season so far. And your surplus trivia is, what type of sculpture does Angela want for her wedding? It doesn't make any sense, I am telling As always, I run comment contests in these videos, answer the trivia first, spout out the Easter egg, and or leave the best emoji sequence summing up next week's episode, and you'll get your name in that video. Today I'm gonna talk about the Steel Series office chairs, and then do some math. What's 394 times 5,912? Let's see. And as always, be warned, there may be some spoilers for the series ahead. So with that, let's spin this one. I understand nothing. Right, so there's so much to love in this episode, and I haven't just gushed about an episode of The Office lately, so please indulge me for a little bit. The surplus is an example of an episode that is just what is so good about The Office? It's such a simple premise that's accessible to anyone who's ever managed a budget or argued with their brother about what video game they're gonna buy with their combined Christmas money. That, that one's just me? Okay. Whew. And the B-plot revolves around Andy and Angela's wedding planning with Dwight, which leads to some great stuff. Dwight, I'm a little concerned about some of these directions to Shrewd Farms. Yeah, do tell. If you are attacked by territorial crows. <laughs> if you smell bear pee, turn the other way. I Arguably the best joke written in this episode didn't make the final cut. I tried to do some research once. Mose and I rented a movie about a Latina wedding planner with a big fat ass. <laughs> you know, wedding planner with a big fat ass. <laughs> I tried to do some research once. Mose and I rented a movie about a Latino wedding planner with enormous... <laughs> it's just gold. Okay, so while we're taking bloopers at Shrewd Farms, we have to include this one. Mose. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're still at the barn, while Dwight's hijacking Angela's marriage, if this Mennonite minister seems familiar to you, it's because we've seen him in about 200 Chevy car commercials over the last five or so years in the US. Also, maybe everyone else noticed this, but he rides a horse home. Another hidden goodie that I think flew by me more than a few times was this. I believe that was the same piece of cake that Jim brought for Pam. Good stuff. And we know this because Michael says this later. And we are spoiled because we throw out perfectly good tiramisu because it has a little tiny hair on it. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm eating tiramisu. On Michael, here's a great Michaelism. I like this chair. Offers good support. It is ergonomically correct. And maybe just my favorite line of this entire episode is, hmm, not much lumbar support. No. I don't know why. I just don't, but it kills me every time. Hmm, not much lumbar support. No. Chronologically though, I don't know when Michael bought this jacket. Never buy a fur coat with a credit card until you absolutely have the money to pay for it. So as we know, Michael ends up agreeing to buy them chairs. We'll get into that debate in just a second, but my question is, we don't actually ever see them get new chairs, do we? I browsed through the next few episodes and I spotted out Andy's chair and it stays unchanged in the next episode, so I skipped a few ahead to stress relief and it's still the same chair. So my question is, where did this money actually go? It sounds an awful lot like what I do here every day. And here's the big one, the debate. Team copier versus team chair. All right, so team's forming. Which are you on? We know where Pam sits. Pun. And this isn't the first time she's brought this up. Michael, new chairs. These chairs are terrible. We were supposed to get new ones last year. Which is a nice nod in continuity. When Pam gets Michael's old chair, I get Pam's old chair. Then I'll have two chairs, only one to go. And while I normally like to ride the middle and just get you guys to argue things out in the comments, I'm gonna posit that there's only one answer to this debate, and it's team chair. Everyone sits on a chair every day. 
mm -hmm. but not everyone sits on a copier or even uses the copier every day. But for people who work in an office, your chair is where you spend most of your day. Hmm. Not much lumbar support. It's such a stupid piece of technology on the surface, but a bad chair can actually have crazy health impacts that you never see coming. You'll see. And I'll just say that these chairs, they suck. A good chair, on the other hand, it can literally change your life. Let me see the copier again. All right, get out, get out. Further, if a copier breaks, the budget for its replacement is probably coming from the much deeper pockets of IT asset management then whatever pocket the Dunder Mifflin might spend on facility budgets in their regional office. This sign has been on the wall for three years now. It's never getting replaced and neither are these chairs. Pam is right. Team chairs for the win. Leave a comment. Team chairs or team compiers and fight in the comments. Fight, fight, fight. I'm coming, fight. And I have to pause what I was gonna talk about next here because I was reading this Wikipedia article on this episode and this comment baffled me. Pam is nasty towards Jim during this episode. Is that what people think? This is extremely playful banter, right? I mean, they're both doing it. I love you, but you should know you're on very dangerous ground. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna need four. I think anyone thinking that Pam and Jim are actually fighting during this one are reading more into this than what is shown. Honestly, find someone that you can play with this much. You look really pretty. Thank you. This kind of banter is a staple in my marriage. I'm pretty sure that both of us would lose our minds if we couldn't goof around with each other like this. But okay, gosh, I feel like a Pam apologist on this channel and I'm not, or I guess I should say I don't wanna be. It's just like Dwight tricked someone into marrying him in this episode. Legally. That doesn't count. Yes, of course it does. No, it doesn't. It does in the state of Pennsylvania. Now I have to take care of a legal issue. But no, Pam, she wanted chairs for herself and everyone else, that nasty woman. The ball's on you, man. Anyway, all this did get me wondering what kind of chairs they could actually purchase for this much money. So $4,300, according to this random website, uh, would be about $5,300 in 2021 dollars. And if there's 15 employees, I'm going to Thailand with some friends from high school. Well, a high school. Right, 14 employees means that there's about $378 per chair. And I'm actually just gonna round that up to 400 for simplicity's sake. I don't really know how that stacks up in the corporate office chair world. So I'm gonna ask the facility person at my company what they would recommend as a price point. Are we leaving or what? Ow. All right, facilities told me that companies spend anywhere between $150 and $850 for office chairs, depending on the fanciness and features. The really great mesh black high back swivel chair. I asked what the best option for around $400 would be, and she immediately pointed me towards this delightful Steelcase Series 1 ergonomic, essential for everyone, anywhere, stylish office chair. Steelcase Series 1, where performance and choice intersects to create the precipice of comfort and support required for the modern office worker. Fully customizable with such elegant colors like black licorice. Take those black licorice, then go get some of those red licorice. Take them in your hand, roll them up real tight. And shove it up my butt. Damn it, Jim! Night Owl, Peacock, Dove, and White. Not really sure if they lost creativity for that one. So for five more dollars, you can get an adjustable arm and customizable wheels for the appropriate floor types. All of this for just $400. And I know comparing to what was available in 2008 to these modern chairs, probably doesn't really stack up right. But even if you settled for this price point in 2008, it was definitely a step up from whatever garage sale these things were picked up from. And of course, now that I did all of that research, I'm getting inundated with a thousand chair ads on Facebook and everywhere else. So I hope that was worth it for everyone. With that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. I swallowed all your ideas. I'm going to digest them and see what comes out the other end. Okay, this one's pretty neat, I think. We have these parallel stories going on in a way that The Office does so well. Where on the surface, the main story, we have this office drama where half the office is split over decision of comfort versus function. And in the B plot, we have Angela split over a decision of comfort versus function. Andy's comfort because he's not a risk and Dwight's function because of... <laughs> 
we see someone attempt to make the decision on behalf of the decision makers. Michael tries to coerce the office into forsaking the cause of buying anything. I've seen the light in terms of what we need, and it is nothing. And Dwight flat out tricks a woman into marrying her. Why don't we ever see that on a list of terrible things the office characters have done? I don't know. Either way, we have casualties on all sides. In the end, Michael and Dwight, the choice removers, are served up a nice hot plate of humble pie. <coughs> Sorry. And the choice makers are forced to choose between the best available options, leaving some of them not completely satisfied with their outcome, but, you know, hopeful nonetheless. What did we learn this week? I'm not really sure what the message of this episode is. Why don't you explain this to me like I am an eight year old? There's this web in this episode that's really far stretched. Pam and Andy come out on top, but I'm not sure it's because they fought harder. Michael and Dwight fought really hard and they get nowhere. They actually take steps back. Mother. So with no clear message, I got to wondering when the last time I said that was. And so I searched my notes and poof, it was the weight loss episode, another great episode with a deeper meaning that does such a good job of intertwining the idea of the A-plot through the rest of the stories. Yet in the end, there's no real clear message. It's just a thrilling experience and a really good episode. And that got me wondering if that was a coincidence or not. So I went back and I found every time in the series that I've said something like this so far, and that's 82 episodes. So I've done 82 of these, wow. The majority of the times I concluded that there was this ambiguous message are actually, interestingly enough, Stupenberg episodes, which means that this is done on purpose and maybe there's no clear moral supposed to be there. It's a really interesting thing and I actually do love the way that these guys write these episodes. We have four more Stupenberg episodes left in the series, so we're gonna see if this trend continues. And with that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> All right, so for the cold opening, it's interesting that they cut what I think was the original cold opening of this episode. It's supposed to lull me into a sense of calm and then a ghoul pops up and scares me. Ah! Oh no, a scary ghoul just popped up. Jim, how are you? Pretty sure the few times I've covered cold openings that were just regular episode sequences repurposed to cram more story into the 22 minute runtime just haven't been that good. But this one on the other hand, well, it's amazing. But guess what? Next summer, I'll be six. I think it's a testimony to how well this episode is written and acted. And it seems like half the bloopers from season five are actually from this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna give this episode and cold opening a five out of five. As far as filler episodes go, this is the stuff that dreams are made of. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? The surplus is nonstop, hands down, one of the funniest episodes of the series for me. It doesn't make the likes of a lot of top 10 lists because it does lack something extremely memorable, or in other words, it doesn't have a butt liquor or a prison mic moment that is so extremely iconic that it locks into people's memories. Instead, this episode just came to work that day and it just knocked it out of the park. Like it was sitting in the Steel Series 1000 or whatever it was called. I should get paid. If you guys make Steel Series and you're watching this video, I could sponsor. Oh, you are a smart guy. I know you'll do the right thing. Everyone and everything just is on point to pull this one off. Five out of five, well earned. But that's just what I think about the surplus. What are your thoughts? I wanna hear from you in the comments. Don't forget to leave what side you're on, team chairs or team copier. Don't forget the comment contest, including the emoji sequence for next week's episode, which is, this isn't your grandmother's Christmas party. Also check out our Discord and the Patreon page if you want to support the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for the mini reviews after this, and we'll see you next time.